Hello everyone, my name is Beth Bovis and welcome to our Earth Day discussion, Planet versus Plastics, a discussion about reuse. Um, I am a partner at Kearney and very proud to be the co-lead of our sustainability work here in the Americas and a part of our global sustainability effort. Um, at Kearney, we're especially proud of the work we've been doing in circularity, and a big part of that has been a collaboration with the World Economic Forum in support of reuse and reuse models over the past number of years. And so we're very excited to bring some folks who've been a part of that journey with us um, onto the stage here to, to join us for a conversation about reuse and its importance in the overall um, battle around circula circularity and Earth Day and in the ability to improve sustainability. So I'm really excited about our three guests that we have here. Um, we're gonna bring them on the stage here. We have Tom Almeida, who is the head of Circular Economic Systems at the World Economic Forum, Amy Larkin, the founder and director of PR3, and Dagny Tucker, who's the chief strategy and system design at Perpetual. And because I could um, wax on about all of you, but you can probably do a much better job than me of doing uh, yourselves justice. If I could ask each of you to introduce yourself and also your organizations and what you've been doing in this space. And Tom, maybe we'll start with you. Sure, thank you so much, Beth, and great to be here. So um, my name is Tom Almeida. I'm a lead for Circular Economic Systems at the World Economic Forum and in this role, uh, I'm the head of the Consumers Beyond Waste Initiative, as Beth mentioned, which is led together with Carney. Uh, Carney have been our longstanding knowledge partners for this initiative. And really, the CBW initiative brings together a vibrant community of uh, public and private sector organizations who are collectively accelerating a system of transition towards reuse to achieve a world free of plastic pollution. So I'll keep it pretty short. I'll hand it over to the next person. Amy, maybe we could turn it over to you. You've got a long history and, and a great some great organizations, please. Sure. Uh, I'm Amy Larkin, and five years ago, I co-founded PR3 with Clara Jaska. And our impetus was that each of us had been working independently of one another with a combination of global NGOs, multinationals, and small businesses on strategies to reduce plastic use. And we both understood that reuse was a central piece of this and that you could not do reuse without a system. It doesn't work without a system. And Claudette actually understood that you need standards to build a system. And um, so we set aside, we set out to create these standards and then we uh, met with over a thousand people. I, I, at some point, we've lost track of the number of from every corner, from multinationals to informal waste sector people in India and Philippines, and everyone in between, and created the first draft of the standards. After we did that, we started vetting these first draft with people like Tom and his colleagues at WEF or Dagny and her colleagues at Perpetual and others that we had been closely working with over the years. And fast forward today, we have a panel of 68 people that is global, that represents, uh, again, the span of people in the reuse value chain and uh, the standards are being implemented deployed early deployment in about 10 countries. And one other thing that is probably of real interest to Kearney clients is that embedded in our standards development, which is something new in the standards world, is that we have integrated directly in equity, accessibility, and diversity so that it is not a little side dish internally in these standards those pieces of standards that can help all of those things ensuring equity accessibility diversity are inside the both on the panel and in the standards and that's enough dagny over to you 
Such a pleasure to be here, Beth Dagny Tucker, uh, and uh, co-founder at Perpetual as well with Ellie Moss. And you know, our origin story is somewhat similar in the sense that both Ellie and I had been working in the space a long time. Myself as a reusable service provider, I founded a company called Vessel in 2015 in New York City, um, and then grew that across Colorado and into California. And over numerous years, you know, over the span of watching reuse go from zero to an explosion, at least um, from a business to consumer end of, of reuse, not B2B reuse, really both Ellie and I began to see a lot of gaps. Um, she comes from a sustainability consulting background, 20 years, and specifically looking at plastics for the five years prior to co-founding Perpetual. And really, um, we were seeing a lot of pilots, but very little at scale and a lot of successes in pilots. But there were really important elements missing. Um, and one of the biggest being somebody to coordinate all of the players and be able to bring a systems thinking perspective at a city level to really design a system that would be plausible for scale and for the long term. And so we've come together to do that work. We're working in four U.S. cities, as well as many other projects that are, are starting to go global. So that's the short. Keep it there. More details. More details to come. Well, thank yeah. you all for being here. And, um, you know, this year, like every year, we talk a lot about plastic and plastic waste. And uh, back when we first started working in reuse with with WEF, we we did a calculation that just 10% reuse could eliminate uh, you know almost 50% of the waste that sits out in um, out in the environment. And with those kinds of ratios and that kind of impact, it it makes sense that reuse is a critical part of the solution and a part of the discussion. But um, also, I've learned over the years that. When we say the words reuse, people mean very different things and people sometimes um, get confused. And I was wondering whether you could maybe give your definition of reuse and give us a couple of examples of reuse in action that will help people um, understand what we mean when we say, what are these reuse systems and systems thinking and at scale, what that really means and bring it to life. So um, Dagny, did you wanna start? Sure, I'm happy to. So for us, <clears throat> the definition of reuse would be the, the reuse of a product that was created and reused for its original attempt, a, original design multiple times. Reuse systems would imply or mean that there is an entire system behind that product. So that means that baked into that reusable item is the infrastructure, the logistics, the washing, the necessary elements to actually make that piece of packaging reusable. So that's the short. Definitions are a big conversation right now, particularly with INC. So I'll start us off with that one and I'm sure my co-panelists can add too. Sure. Amy, do you wanna build on that? Sure, I think that um, Dagny, I go with Dagny's definition. Mm -hmm. And um, I would add on top of that, that uh, it is to work for, the system has to work for different kinds of products. So, the, and this is where the standards come in. I go buy a cup of coffee at my favorite cafe. I'm happily drinking it. I then wanna put it in a reuse bin on the street or in the park or on the subway or in my office, wherever, in the theater. It goes in the bin and somebody else got lunch somewhere in a clamshell and they wanna put it in the same reuse bin. And somebody else wanted to get, you know, had olive oil and that also, it, the, these, the infrastructure has to work across sectors and places. And right now uh, there is, a lot of closed loop systems that are becoming more and more effective and more and more ubiquitous. 
And I, you, you brought you brought this up, and I wanted to mention this, Beth. There's one that I know of where they brought in reuse, and in three months, their entire waste piece, not just the cups and the this and the, the clamshells, their entire waste uh, amount was decreased by 35%. And they, for a weird reason, had 20% fewer people there. It's 35% less garbage than they had before the pandemic. And I think that um, it brings us just to one other thing on reuse, which is the clarifying thing for me, and Dagny brought it up. It is a circuit, you know, people think, conflate all the time reuse and recycling. It is a bugaboo that all of us could talk about for the rest of the hour. But in fact, the beauty part is that with reuse, you do not have to remanufacture. And if you're doing things right, you don't have to reship product very far. With that, you have a huge climate savings. Mm -hmm. And so reuse is both a plastic and a climate solution. Tom, take it from me, please. <laughs> Great. No, I think um, both you and Dagny covered it really well. And um, the World Economic Forum maintains more or less the same definition, which is that reuse is an operation by which a container is refilled or reused for the same purpose for which it was originally conceived. So very much what you said as well, Dagny. Uh, and I think you also made a very good uh, point on also focusing on that being underpinned by a system for reuse, namely infrastructure. Maybe one thing I'll just add here is that um, uh, it's also important to think about the different segments or the different modalities for reuse. So brief on home or buy it. Uh, users who fill their reusable containers at home, for example, soda stream, refill on the go, uh, where users refill their containers elsewhere, for example, at an in-store uh, dispensing system in grocery stores, uh, return from home, where packaging is picked up um, by pickup service, uh, loop, for example, is a great example, um, and then return on the go, where uh, users return the package at a, at a drop-off point. So there are many of these examples across the four modalities. I think that should also be included within the uh, definition of reuse overall. And, and Tom, maybe continuing on with you beyond that, we, we've talked about um, the benefits of reuse, but maybe you could just give us a little bit of an overview in terms of how does how does reuse really work in terms of the benefits? How is it that you could end up with thirty five percent less garbage and fifty percent less um, ocean waste? Let, let's let's spell it out a little bit for people about why these systems are um, are so desirable and so impactful. Sure, I'm happy to. And I think it's also really important maybe to to take a quick step back here and focus both on the the plastic pollution, but also the the plastic generation. So there's just a sheer volume of uh, plastic production that's been ongoing, as well as the amount of plastic waste that's that's generated. Um, but the annual production of plastics has increased 230-fold, um, from 2 million tons in the 1950s to 460 million tons by the early 2020s. So that's really unprecedented. Um, it's it's of course, not going in the right direction. And, and half of global plastic production is for single-use applications with only about 9% of plastics being recycled globally. So really, uh, as we always say um, within our Consumers Beyond Waste community, recycling alone will not solve the plastic pollution crisis. And then on top of that, aside from that um, alarming waste footprint, um, plastic production also increases carbon emissions, it negatively impacts human health. Um, and then also from an economic standpoint, as has been mentioned also, um, single-use packaging is simply inefficient. 95% of the value is lost after its initial use. So really reuse helps to avoid plastic use by, by keeping packaging and uh, circulation many times over, uh, thus moving from a linear to a circular system. And of course, the higher the number of returns and therefore the number of uses, the better in terms of plastic reduction and environmental impact. 
Can I just say, Tom yeah. just said it all. <laughs> As <laughs> usual, right? <laughs> I'm so happy to hear you say those things, Tom. Perfect. Thank you. Really, like, boom. You know, given your your different, um, the different roles you play in the in the reuse system and 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 advancing it, I would love to get, hear from each of you. Kind of, what do you think are some really successful examples whether they're i know getting to scale is one of the big challenges but but what are some of the successful examples um that are out there that we should be celebrating as we're thinking about about reuse uh, uh i'll start and then, yep. i would say first of all i want to say there are many places in the world where reuse is the norm mm -hmm. And so uh, go to India and you see the get people carrying the tiffin containers and uh, just many, many, many places where waste is not part of the culture or the economy. And so that would be the first place I would start. I think also um, corporate campuses are more and more embracing it and there are good reuse service providers and that, that's the closed loop end of the puzzle there are certain neighborhoods around the world where <clears throat> there is interoperability so small cafes that are that are open-ended and uh, dagny i'm sure we'll talk about what they're doing in the cities they're working on is tremendous work and um in theaters and stadiums around the world and certain cities where there's things are happening. Uh, there is um, two things I, I want to mention. The first is one of our partners, we've been, we have partners in Jakarta and we have for four years. And they just created something called the Asia Reuse Consortium. And it's five countries, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, India, and another. Uh, and um, they are working together to develop, I think Vietnam, and uh, they are developing uh, reuse systems, reuse efforts, re the whole thing. They're developing it together. Now, isn't that smart? And this is akin to how Perpetual is working. I think that, uh, the way that reuse systems have to develop, I describe it as sewing a quilt. And um, I want to say to your clients who talk about circular economy all the time, mm -hmm. circular means you do have to hold hands with a whole bunch of people you're not used to holding hands with and move together. And um, this is the future. And I just, I'm going to give, we, we had, I don't know, maybe three, four years ago with the head of circularity for a very big company who said, who's the head of circularity, oh, we really want to do this. This would be great. How much time do you think, you know, transform our entire operation and business model? How much time do you think uh, it will take? And we said, well, probably three hours a week, our best guess is from you and someone else and then varying times more from people going deep in the weeds. And he responded, oh, well, I don't have time for that. Well, then don't say you're going to change your business model. And I think that uh, I say this to your clients deeply. Make the time, make the commitment, and it will be worth it. It's clear the players are on the ground, the standards are being developed, the money's there. Go for it. Go for it. Well, maybe Dagny, over to you to talk a little bit about what, you know, what are the prevalent cases, the successful cases that both inspire you at Perpetual, but also that you're a part of making happen. Sure. Well, I think that um, we often think about reuse as emerging, and it is on the business to consumer side, but I think we often forget to tell the story of business to business reuse. And it is a long and fruitful history. And we have seen business to business packaging and reusable containers in the hundreds and hundreds of millions. 
for decades at this point, whether it's produce or pallets or other types of packaging. So there are long success stories around um, supply chain handshakes along the way to make this stuff work. So we know how to do it. The other big successes I would say, and I think it's changed a lot and we don't speak of the milkman model, people like mm -hmm. to, but we have a, we know we have, we have harm has occurred from technology, but great things have occurred from technology and our ability to track assets to get these products into people's hands and get them back and know how to efficiently move them around is a huge success story. The asset tracking capacity and our ability to use technology to make these systems seamless has just exploded. And even in the last several years, I would say we've entered new territory and how easy it has become for people to use these systems. So I think the reason we're going to hear so much more now um, and are moving into the business to consumer side is that we have enabling technologies that is going to make this really feasible. Excellent. Well, like you all mentioned, Tom, anything you want to add on some great examples? I don't want to. No, I think Daki and uh, Amy yeah. covered it really well. I mean, maybe the final thing I'll just add, they were both talking about um, consumer behavioral aspects in a way. So it's really important to think about how do you make these habits stick with people? Really, what is the, let's say, the gateway experience for, for consumers? And mm -hmm. um, Amy mentioned the, the closed loop ecosystem, such as university campuses and stadiums. So when we think about major events, for example, sports events like the Paris Olympics this summer uh, mm -hmm. coming up, those are great moments to socialize the yes. concepts of reuse and refill to many consumers. And equally so for um, kind of the, the cultural or social change that's required. In a sense, we have to go back, as Dagny said, to the milkman model from the 1950s, where um, packages, containers were used many times over. People were much more um, conscious about their overall consumption. And that still exists in some countries like India and other countries where it's, it's, it's more economically driven. So we should really reimagine how do we get back to that type of uh, consumption ecosystem in, in many countries such as the United States. I think that, um, first of all, I think there is a hunger, a great desire from consumers to be, to have the opportunity to do something that's better than what they're doing. And I'm not talking about that. I know that there is a, a, a schism between what people say they want and what they buy. So I'm not talking about a fake thing. I'm, and I'm not talking about greenwash. I think for most young people who are growing up with an environmental apocalypse in front of them, the idea that, oh, I can do this better and it's convenient and it's efficient and I understand it's environmentally better. I, I think there will be automatic peer pressure to participate in, in, in a good way. Like I've always said that I hope that the reuse is joyful because, you know, it is, it's, it is not nutritious. It is joyful. It is, easy it is better and i think that for any business wanting to keep a youth market they better get with the program i don't think it's going to be this i just think our job is to develop infrastructure that makes it convenient that makes it effective financially viable we do that it's like of course, it's just joy. Why would you ever waste stuff and be part of the problem when you can just as easily not waste it and be part of the solution? I just think, I feel like there's a lot of talk about that. And I feel like it's almost a false premise. Yeah. You guys can disagree, but I think we set it up right the consumers, the customers will come. 
Well, I think if the number of pilots happening in companies uh, is any indication, I, I think there's many that agree with you that um, the uh, the movement towards having reuse as part of your solution, now everybody's on a different percentage basis, but having reuse as part of what you're doing is has definitely taken foot. Um, we talked a little bit about about scale, but I want to talk a bit about kind of how standards and, and other things are necessary to make this happen. We've, we've got certainly companies starting to set targets. Um, Tom, you've convened you know, a group of, of willing uh, volunteers to start piloting and thinking about how to, um, how to measure reuse. And then we have on the big scale, um, the negotiations underway with the United Nations and the Plastics Treaty that will certainly impact and influence this. Um, you know, Amy, given given your role, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit just on the basics of why it's so important that we have um, design standards and metrics in, in order to scale. And then, and then maybe Dagnail will talk to you about what at the city level you've seen as an enabler for scale. <clears throat> So uh, at PR3, we have seven standards that are currently under review by a panel that I spoke about before. Mm -hmm. And they include containers where we do not give, there's not a prescription what the container should look like. It is a prescription for, it has to be designed so it doesn't have an example, doesn't have ridges so that pathogens can get stuck in there. That's the, that's when that's the kind of design standard for containers collection points so that they will work both for high tech ones and low tech ones and ones that are staffed, depending on where they are. Um, digital, there's a digital standard because the probably RFID or barcodes that are on assets uh, from cups to clamshells to you know, milk bottles uh, will have to communicate, have information and a language that can work with the waste haulers, the waste pickers, the cleaners, the inventory, the point of, you know, all of that. So there's a digital standard with a, a common language will be integrated. There is, uh, there's four other standards, which I, I won't go through, but um, they they are the pieces that comprise the system and allows for shared infrastructure to be built. And um, first standard that is valid for accreditation for this panel is the washing standard, which of course is one that is near and dear to many companies' hearts because of course it better be safe. Mm -hmm. And um I think what the standards do is they allow for efficiency, they ensure that there's environmental performance, they make everything cheaper, they ensure that equity is embedded, all those things that um, Tom is busy helping design metrics for. Uh, <laughs> and so um, it is a tool to build the blueprint and um, there is tremendous interest. We know this because of what is coming in. Uh, when we began five years ago, what standards, what are you talking about? And now I'm so pleased to say the business coalition for the plastic treaty uh, includes standards in what they feel is necessary to build the reuse industry. So I think there is an understanding across the board that this is this is going to make it this is what is needed to make it work and we have astonishingly great people working on our panel to improve the draft standards that we first wrote thanks so much Dagny, maybe you could reflect on as you're trying to look citywide what are some of those standards metrics things that are um the enablers of scale and system thinking for you yeah, absolutely. I'll follow up on two things Amy said. I mean, standards are a given, and I think um, they're a given for interoperability, efficiencies, all of the things that Amy um, spoke of. I think that 
as she mentioned, businesses are hungry for this. Uh, they, they need to make sure what they're going to put out there is going to work. Retailers have very specific ways they want their products put on shelves. And coming to some agreement about um, reusable standards enables not only the producers, but the retailers to plan. So it, it's critical on every level of the supply chain. I would say, you know, we touched a little bit on the behavior. For us, our, our premise is that, you know, we... Um, we, we jokingly say that pilot is a four letter word for us. <laughs> we, have, we have seen um, and pilots are incredibly important, but we are in a position now, at least with foodware in our opinion that, you know, what enables scale at this point in a reuse system is scale. Uh, you need to have from a behavior perspective, you need to have the ubiquity, a, an immersive experience that actually matches that convenience that users already have. You're competing against a single use system that has been propped up by billions of dollars in putting out infrastructure to then collect that single use waste. And so you need to mimic an infrastructure that allows users to have an experience that's similar to the one that they are used to having. Additionally, the scale is what enables the economics of the system. And this is where you have a real chicken and egg problem, where I think standards are going to help as well, where you need scale in the system, but you don't have companies that are willing to put scale into the system because the infrastructure to support scale or the investment required to transition over to a reusable packaging type without the assurance that that's going to be the packaging that's going to be used going forward is simply too risky for businesses. So you have to have that scale. And then genuinely, the environmental wins really come with scale and the efficiencies derived from scale as well. So we, um, in our four cities, we, we, are, we do not have pilot projects. We, we have systems that are launching at scale and in perpetuity. Fabulous. Well, well Tom, standards and scale um, gets us right to something that I know you've been focusing on a, a lot, it, which is the metrics. And how do we measure it, we, we do all this, but how do we measure and know that we're making progress on this, um, that we're actually eliminating um, play, um, eliminating this, that I'm not taking my reusable package and treating it like a single use package and not <laughs> and not you know creating loops with it. So talk to us a little bit about some of the metrics and measurement conversations and where you've landed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when it comes to metrics and, and measurement, uh, equally here, it's, it's absolutely essential that everyone speaks the same language, uses common definitions and, and terminology for reuse. Um, just consider all the difference and, and complex variations um, of reuse. For example, how do we account for a system where the main container is reusable, but the auxiliary container used to refill the main one is not? So there are all these uh, I don't know if you could call them edge cases, but sometimes gray areas where we really need to have consistency around inclusions and exclusions around reuse. And that's something that we've been working on uh, a lot with our consumers beyond waste community. Uh, we, of course, also need harmonized success metrics to be able to measure progress on reuse and uh, the forms CBW community together with uh, Carney also spent more than a year building uh, guiding principles for measurement, and we prioritize two metrics, um, which we think together best reflect progress on reuse. So one is a volume-based metric, and another metric focuses on the number of loops or rotations of the reusable package. And those two in tandem are really the most effective in demonstrating progress um, on reuse. And then of course, the, the standard metrics will ultimately allow organizations to set reuse targets that are comparable with one another. Um, the guidelines are also publicly available. So for your um, viewers and listeners, uh, I'd highly encourage them to take a look at our website. And now for um, our work, it's really um, critical that we focus on achieving convergence, wide scale convergence amongst the organizations of these guiding principles for measurements and metrics, and then also support adoption by industry, by, um, by organizations, and to also really ensure the integration of those metrics and measurement approaches into the relevant accounting and, and policy frameworks. Can, and, and can I just 
yeah. add one thing on top of that, which I think I am. I love the work that WEF is doing on metrics, and I think it's very important. And we work closely with them on with the standards development on environmental performance. And I just want to note that the reuse industry is a nascent industry, but it is booming. And um, looking at metrics that are as transparent, as clear as they can be, whereas the single use economy has no such metrics, pays no, you know, pays none of the external costs. And um, I just want to, again, say to your clients that, and to anybody else who sees this, that we are moving forward with, this is a new way of doing business. This new industry is coming forward with the, I am going to use this word, the word, uh, the honor to recognize where it is straightforwardly environmentally strong, where there are weaknesses. And if the single use packaging industry wants to do the same thing, let's have a really good discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of discussions um you and you mentioned policy um we're coming up to ottawa in the next uh convening of, of a series of discussions around the u.n treaty negotiations and you know how maybe you could share with folks how much is reuse being featured in some of these conversations what's the important role of reuse as we look at um this more comprehensive treaty around plastic i don't know who wants to start <clears throat> Dagny looks. Uh... I'm, I'm happy to jump in. You right. know, I, I, I think there's an extraordinary opportunity for reuse, and I think there's an extraordinary opportunity at the treaty, um, also, on reuse. So I think use will benefit from the treaty, and obviously, as has already been stated, you know, reuse is one of the most promising opportunities for source reduction of plastics. Um, packaging, Tom already gave us all the incredible statistics, right? I would say that we are seeing extreme interest on the reuse piece. I believe that standards, are, it's clearly recognized, um, both by high ambition, um, but I would say many of the in-between delegations as well. There is, I would say, um, there's less conflict about reuse generally than other topics. I think everybody sees it, but I think the, the, the devil is in the details of how we get reuse defined in the treaty um, and specific language that ends up in the treaty. And I would say there is a learning journey for everybody coming into reuse. And it starts out like this. Reuse, that sounds great. Let's do that. Of course, reuse. And then it does that thing where where you say, how many hours is it going to take and how much funding is going to be required? And, how, and then it starts to get a little bit more foggy. And then people start to dig into the realities of what it takes. And then there's a pause. And I think that we are starting to move through that pause in many places. And I think we're starting to move through that pause with delegations as well who are recognizing that um, the externalized costs of single use are extraordinary and that there's no reason we shouldn't think of reuse systems as needing um, some extraordinary investment. It's an investment that we've been giving to single use for decades. And that when thought of holistically, at the end of the day, it's going to bring better jobs, less pollution, all of the wins that we know about. So I think that, you know, um, our hope is that at INC4, the strong work of delegations continues to really get the definitions in place and also the financial mechanisms that are going to be required through the EPR section of the treaty. Great. Thank you. Anything to add, Tom or Amy? Uh, no, I think I think reuse is one of the non-controversial pieces in the treaty. 
I think there is, I don't know if it's universal, but very strong support, as Dagny said. And um, I think the financial mechanism, of course, is going to be a key piece. The definition, I think, I, I think there's, you know, there's, there's issues, but I don't think it's going to be a big controversial piece of it until we get to fighting about the money. As always. All right. Um, maybe as we're coming into the home stretch of our conversation here, I, I want to get, um, you know, get people excited about reuse here. <laughs> I want to get, get everybody as excited as, as we can get about it. And, um, you know, Tom, maybe I'm going to start with you. I know you did some work around, you know, consumer sentiment and what we're hearing about from consumers about reuse. And Amy mentioned that certainly from a youth perspective and honestly, from even a natural inclination perspective, people can love reuse systems and do already today. T tell us a little bit about, you know, what um, what you've heard from what Web's been doing from consumers about reuse and, and growing demand. Sure. So I think this ties in really well to um, everything we've been talking about so far around standards, but also very much infrastructure. And I think really at a baseline level, when it comes to consumer engagement, consumer adoption, we, we just really need to increase the availability of reusable packaging mm -hmm. solutions and reuse systems on the market for consumers right now, even for deep green consumers, light green consumers, I would come myself as somebody who's very sustainability oriented. And, and uh, of course, my, you know, I, I live dream reuse, but even for me, it's, it's quite difficult to, to live out exactly what I, um, what I would want to do. So um, the infrastructure needs to be um, built, the financing mechanisms behind it are key. But as Dak already alluded to earlier, there's this chicken and egg problem where right now there's just not the scale required in order to, to get there. Um, and then also importantly, reuse needs to be equally or even more convenient and aspirational and affordable for consumers compared to disposable packaging. That's currently not the case. So um, it's really about the, the aspiration, the affordability, the convenience um, um, for consumers to make it much more attractive to switch towards reusable options. And at the forum, um, especially in our team, we focus a lot on how does social change at scale occur? And um, it's really very much institution-led action. So yes, consumers want to act, but they don't have the resources to do so often, um, whether it pertains to kind of uh, the cost or convenience or something else. So it's really businesses and governments that need to act first, and then the consumer demand will follow. And there really are significant opportunities for new value creation. There have been many successful pilots and initiatives by companies. Um, so the solutions are there. It's just about reaching scale. And if we get all companies to move in tandem and not just a few progressive ones, that will then unlock consumer demand. Excellent. Well, you know, Dagny, I wanted to ask you about, you know, you said, you know, we're not piloting, we're going at scale is at scale. What led you to select foodware and and the sector that you did as the place to start um, for for this? Yeah, that's a great next question because to that consumer behavior, you know, there's a piece of consumer behavior that has to do with social proofing. And you see what's normalized out there. You see how the person in line is interacting. We learn from one another. This is how things happen. And so really we've selected foodware for that reason as one where it's highly visible. You know, the reason why everybody is like, oh, reuse has existed in B2B, it's because it's invisible. It's not something we're seeing in the everyday. So getting reuse out there in a way that it's highly visible allows for that social proofing and social normalizing to take place. Additionally, foodware makes a lot of sense because it's a short supply chain. Right. And the, the easiest reuse is reuse that's in in short supply chains where that item can turn around and be refilled right there within a specific geographic area. And that's happening in CPG events that are taking place now with fractional manufacturing. So it's not just foodware, but those are two of the big reasons why we led with foodware. 
you know, and, and Amy, you've said it a couple of times, like reuse is booming, right? <laughs> yeah. It's what? It's booming. It's like all over the place. It, it's, yeah. it is there. Um, tell me about, you know, are there some particular challenges that as you guys are looking and you're having the, you know, thousands of conversations about these standards and other things um, that you're also hearing that people are working to overcome to just to, to take us to the next level? Yes. I, I, uh, first of all, I, I want to answer the question you asked. Yes. Tom. <laughs> Absolutely. Answer it. Go ahead. <laughs> I think that um, I, I've been working as an environmentalist for almost 40 years. And um, rarely is there a solution that is actually commensurate with the gravity of the problem. And reuse is one of those solutions. So I just want to say, I think that's part of why there is so much attention and it is so attractive to both big businesses, small businesses, cities, the whole deal. Um, and I think that for that reason, I, I think Dagny said this, financing is, you know, the major issue. And I think that from our conversations with governments around the world and with green bonds developers, I think that we all, I'm sure all your clients know this, that there is more money looking to go into green bonds than there are projects that fit the green bond requirements. Reuse infrastructure is one of those things. And I think once perpetual demonstration projects of immersive reuse take off in smaller places and some of the work that is happening around the world, we'll see what happens after the Paris Olympics, what they're doing in Southeast Asia. I think that we as an industry or we as a group of civil society and industry large and small and governments large and small should be ready to move with financing infrastructure and it's one of the things that i think would be a very strong piece in the treaty and i so i think it's my, you know, it's the money as, as the Bill Clinton thing, <laughs> it's the money, stupid. It's not, um, you know, I would say we're not quite ready, but I would say within the year, we will be ready both with the work where, the work of what has been happening on the ground for what is the infrastructure that is going to work at scale. There are, you know, it's all moving incredibly quickly and it will be investment ready confidence, you know, with investor confidence within the year. So our job is to get ready for that mm -hmm. moment and seize it. I'm curious whether you all think that um, because it is, you know, the funding does make a difference. Oh, um, but are we going to have a matching problem, right? Where where the sources of funds and the projects to funds are having trouble finding each other and connecting up in Reese, or you know, how could we avoid that problem? I, I actually, I, there there is one other thing. There is the funding, but the other is the time. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to sewing the quilt. And Perpetual and Dagny knows this better than any of us. The amount of time it takes. For the early projects, we are not plug and play yet. Mm -hmm. And if you are a city, if you're a waste hauler, if you're a washing facility, a reuse service provider, reverse, you know, you name it, a consumer, mm -hmm. a parks developer, a land zoner, you know, all of it, you have to connect with this system. That is time. And Perpetual, that's some of what Perpetual is doing on the ground, which very few others are doing. It's incredibly important and brave work, and it takes a lot of time. And I think that it is the money, but it is also going back to this 
head of circular economy who said, well, I don't have three hours a week to completely change my uh, business model. So I think that's the other piece of it. And I interrupted your question, but I, I do feel it's really important. You, you, you have to commit. You have to commit to doing what you say you want to do. Mm -hmm. And that commitment takes time and effort and energy and money. All of I, it. I will say the good news is we're not trying to, you know, build a house on Mars. You know, it <laughs> takes <laughs> it takes it takes time. It takes time, but they're all known factors, yes. right? There's you know, agreements to work out and there's details to work out and Yes, we take a lot of time working with our cities and all of the stakeholders, but as this becomes more and more normalized, I think that that timeline is going to be shortened. Mm -hmm. You see countries like France, you know, CITEO, their PRO, Producer Responsibility Organization, is responsible for planning the entire country's reuse infrastructure. They are looking at reuse at an entire country level. And that planning has been going on for a year in the scope of things. You know, that's not too much time. It's mm -hmm. not there yet. I think that we are also looking at time horizons that companies and governments can really get behind, mm -hmm. especially for the type of meaningful impact we're going to have on the other side. Yep. Maybe I could just um, go around as we're as we're coming up towards the end here and ask each of you to share you know, what's exciting you about about this? What make what brings you the confidence that reuse and you know the planet's going to beat out plastics and and reuse is going to be a big part of that that solution? Tom, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. So um, for me, in the past few years that I've been working on reuse and I've been leading the Consumers Beyond Waste Initiative, I've just seen. Um, really a tremendous uptake of momentum from both the public and the private sector for reuse, which is really encouraging to see from smaller startups up to large consumer companies that have set industry first targets to government policies, such as in France, Chile, um, the EU with the packaging and packaging waste regulation. So we're really seeing this momentum from all sides. Again, to echo Amy, it's booming everywhere. So that is really uh, a positive signal, I think. We'll be hopefully we'll see more also is more momentum with and for the global south um one of the constituents in the beyond waste initiative is called nvu i think that they do some tremendous work they're a, a not-for-profit impact driven um venture building studio based out of indonesia but active in uh, all of southeast asia and uh, sub-saharan africa and so forth um and really the the plastic pollution crisis is uh, even more severe in the global south. The majority of investments currently go to countries in the global north, and they feel fulfill an incredibly important role in terms of um, building innovation, building companies to support that systems transition towards reuse. So we're seeing a lot of positive momentum, but my hope and my ambition is that we're seeing that not just at a um, local level or with some players in some countries, but really truly globally uh, and inclusively representative. Amy, what's exciting you? What well, everything that Tom said, first mm -hmm. of all. Um, and, you know, a year and a half ago or so, uh, we did, uh, in Uruguay at the INC1 meeting, we did uh, an event, a side event, an event introducing reuse to a combination of delegates and really you so you're talking about recycling no we're talking about reuse it was one of these moments where you realized nobody had any idea what we were <laughs> talking about and now uh and we all know this from incoming you know uh, every morning in my inbox or claudette's my partner's inbox or our team's inbox or we're interested in learning more about, we're interested in doing this. Where can you guide us? We're interested in investing. It, it is, it is, uh, it's just, uh, there, there is extraordinary interest. And I, I always say that, um, 
reuse is like a gateway drug for climate. You know, it's it's a way to enter an understanding of how we are, how we can cut our emissions, and it's a visible piece of climate. Whereas most of what is climate, it it's it's just it's I I think everything Tom said. I don't really have much to add. <laughs> That's great, and Agni. Well, sure. I mean, I think it's hard to express the difference over the last decade when you looked at this mm -hmm. space when I entered it and it was like crickets. Um, and it is just like, as Amy said, you, I cannot keep up. I, I can't even keep up with everything that's happening anymore. So I think there's a hold on to your hats sort mm -hmm. of energy that's happening <laughs> in this space right now. And I think, you know, as, um, as has been said before, you know, um, it's those things that are lying around that get picked up in a crisis. Mm -hmm. So I'll build the best right now because that's what's about to mm -hmm. be the world, design the world that you want to see. And I would say the last little sort of inspiring story is I think we think about food packaging a lot, rightly mm -hmm. so, because it's 40% of the single use packaging. Tom, correct me, maybe it's more. And, um, but I think that the fun thing about reuse and what's just so exciting is that the opportunity is literally everywhere. And we can think about it in certain categories, but I recently heard a pitch and it was for um, a company that is providing refillable washer fluid for vehicles. And it's co-located at the gas station, which makes complete sense. Of course, nobody else Nobody ever thought to package gasoline in single use containers because it's so dangerous. But now, of course, it's the packaging that has become dangerous to us, right? So, what are all the millions of ways you look around in your daily life and see an opportunity to do something differently? How much more exciting is it than that? Well, that is a perfect way to close this up. And I'm going to look for that washer fluid. It's <laughs> um, because so, it is a perfect example of something that should have never been um, single use to start with, uh, for sure. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us today. We we're really excited by the conversation. I am uh, so excited every day uh, to hear some of these new things that are happening. And I can't wait. Uh, I can't wait for the opportunity to chat again and also for all of us to come back and talk about how we got to scale on reuse instead of how we're going to get there. Maybe that'll be our 2026 Earth Day uh, that'd conversation. Be great. <laughs> Wonderful. Can't wait. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Take care and thank Take you. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.